Hello students, welcome to today's English session. Before we begin today's discussion, let me ask how many of you here are artists? How many of you are painters or at least appreciate paintings and sketches? Art is a natural language of expressing oneself and is a universal form of communication. Thomas Merton once said that art enables us to find ourselves and lose ourselves at the same time. Today, we shall discuss an excerpt from an article by Natalie Trevoroy titled Landscape of the Soul, Ethics and Spirituality in Chinese Painting. This excerpt is a comparative study of European and Chinese paintings by Natalie Trevoroy. The chapter begins with a small anecdote about an 8th century Chinese painter Wu Daozi. His last painting was a landscape which was authorized and sponsored by the Tang Emperor Zhuangzong to decorate a palace wall. After his work was completed, he called on the emperor to view and appreciate his painting. He had hidden his painting behind a screen so that only the emperor could view it. The emperor admired the wonderful scenery for a long time, paying attention to the forests, the high mountains, waterfalls, the floating clouds in the sky along with the flying birds and the men walking along a hilly path. The painter then informed the emperor that in the mountain cave at the foot of the mountains lived a spirit. The doors to the cave appeared suddenly after the painter clapped his hands. He then invited the emperor to come inside the cave and led the way forward. However, to the emperor's astonishment, the doors to the cave closed behind the painter and the entire painting vanished from the wall of the palace. That was the last time the painter Wu Daozi was seen in this world. Such legends and anecdotes played an important part in Chinese classical education as they helped the masters to guide their disciples in the right direction. The books of Confucius and Zhuangzi are filled with such stories. These were used by masters to explain the concept and meaning of art and to make abstract ideas comprehensible to their students. Another example of a Chinese painting is given where a famous painter would not draw the eye of a dragon he had painted in fear that it would fly away. The writer contrasts this with a European tale of Antwerp in the 15th century. A master blacksmith, Quintin Metzies, had fallen in love with the painter's daughter but was afraid their love would not be accepted because of his profession. To win his love, Quintin sneaked into the painter's studio and painted a very realistic looking fly on the master's latest panel. The fly was so realistically painted that the painter tried to swat it away. This story is an example of realism in the arts. Realism in painting is the attempt to present subject matter truthfully as it is in originality without avoiding any elements. It is also called naturalism. Impressed by his work, the painter admitted Quintin as an apprentice in his studio and also let him marry his daughter. Quintin later went on to become one of the most famous painters of his age. These two contrasting stories are used to highlight the differences between the objectives and approaches of Chinese and European paintings. European paintings are traditionally more figurative and realistic while the Chinese arts are more abstract. Chinese paintings are abstract since they cannot be explained or defined in real terms. One has to feel or experience the artist's point of view. A Chinese painter does not want you to borrow his eyes or see exactly what he does. He wants you to experience their sense of the inner life and spirit of the painting. European paintings stress on illusionistic likeness where the painter wants you to borrow his eye while viewing his painting. He chooses a single viewpoint and wants his viewers to look at the painting from the same viewpoint as his own. Chinese paintings do not have a single viewpoint. 
the landscape drawn is not a real one and one can enter it from whichever viewpoint he or she wants to. The Chinese painter wants the viewers to actively participate in viewing a painting using his own physical and mental faculties. This is even more true in the case of the horizontal scroll. In Chinese, the traditional scroll painting presents a painting in a different way. The image is painted on a roll of paper or silk and unrolled for viewing. The image painted on the scroll unfolds a scene or a story before you. It is just like an illustrated book that tells a story as the pages are turned. In the words of Jerry Kosinski, the principle of true art is not to portray but to evoke. The Chinese landscape is an inner mental landscape, a spiritual and conceptual space which is expressed as Shan Shui. It means mountain water and represents the landscape of the soul. This should explain to you the title of the chapter. It reflects the Taoist principle of viewing the universe. Taoism is a religious and philosophical tradition of Chinese origin. According to Taoism, this universe is composed of two opposite complementary poles, the yin and the yang. In a landscape presentation, the mountain forms the masculine yang which reaches vertically upwards towards heaven. It is stable, warm and dry in the sun. Its complementary opposite pole is the water or the feminine yin, which flows horizontally on the earth and is fluid, moist and cool. According to the Taoist principle, the interaction of these two energies of yin and yang make up this universe. The interaction point of these two energies is the third element or the middle void. This middle void can be compared to the yogic practice of pranayama, the process of breathing in, retaining the air and then breathing out. This small space of suspension of breath is the void where meditation occurs. Thus, in a Chinese landscape of the unpainted space is the interaction between the mountain or yang and the river or yin. Man too finds a role in the space between the heaven and the earth. He acts as a conduit a connecting channel of communication between the two poles of the universe. His presence in the landscape is essential as according to Frank Hoes Sheng, he is the eye of the landscape. The next part of the chapter has an article published in the in the Sun Times dated 28th August 2005 by Brinda Suri. The article is titled Getting Inside Outside Art. The French painter Jean Dubuffet referred to fine art as cultural art. Art brut is a French term that translates as a raw art. It includes graffiti, works of prisoners, children and primitive artists and is the raw expression of visions or emotions unrestricted by convention. Uh, arising from this concept, the idea of outsider art or art done by academically untrained people who have no formal training but raw talent and artistic insight, art brute or raw art was made of anything from a tin to a sink or a broken down car. It was in a raw state with regards to cultural and artistic influences. An example of this art brute or outsider art is the rock garden at Chandigarh. It is a garden sculpted with stone and recycled material by an 80-year-old Naik Chand. He received international recognition when his rock garden sculpture, Women by the Waterfall, was featured on the anniversary cover of a UK-based magazine pioneering in outsider art publications. Recognizing Naik Chand's art and in order to honor him, the Swiss Commission for UNESCO organized a European exposition of his works. It was a five-month interactive show, Realm of Nechand, at leading museums in Switzerland, Belgium, France and Italy. However, for Nechand, the biggest reward was walking through the garden and watching people enjoy his creations. With that, 
We come to the end of today's chapter where we have seen the contrasting motives and principles of European and Chinese paintings, the effects of Taoism on Chinese paintings, and also the contemporary style of art brute or outsider art. So see you soon in our next video. Till then, goodbye.